So Father, we honor you, we bless you. As we decree and declare, you deserve the glory. For there is no one else like you. We thank you, God, for the privilege and the honor to be called your children. We thank you, God, for the privilege and the honor to call you Father. Thank you, God, for the privilege and the honor to be a part of your kingdom. Thank you, God, for the awesome privilege that you've given us of life and life more abundantly. Now, God, we've converged at this point on this day, God, to hear what you have to say to us. Think with my mind and uh, speak with my lips. Let it be none of me and all of you. Let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. While you're standing, won't you go with me to Matthew chapter 14, verse 27. Matthew chapter 14, verse 27. We want to pause just to acknowledge that we stand in solidarity with all of those who are honoring the memorial of 9-11. Uh, that on tomorrow the world will pause to remember what transpired on September the 11th. That in spite of the calamities and the tragedy, we serve a God that is able to keep us even within the darkest hour. And so we're praying for those who are still mourning the death of their loved ones and still dealing with the, the tragedy, the residue of what transpired on that day. Matthew 14, verse 27, when you have it, say, I got the word. If you don't have it, say, Lord, help me. Amen. In just one moment, it's going to be on the screen. And while they're getting it on the screen, we want to thank those who participated in our karaoke on uh, Friday night. I'm telling you, we had... Uh, District Elder Luther Vandross was here. <laughs> Missionary Aretha Franklin was here. It was absolutely amazing. Mother Vandermark got up there singing. Pop was talking about drinking from somebody's saucer. <laughs> Amen, and it was a time of great fellowship. And we want to thank everyone who made that happen. Amen. Matthew 14, verse 27. And the word of the Lord reads from the New International Version. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it is you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat walked on water and came toward Jesus. When he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worship him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. You may be seated. Peter asked to get off the boat. Jesus said, Come. He's walking on water. Took his eyes off Jesus. Began to sink called for help. Jesus snatched them up and then they went back to the boat. Walked on water, took his eyes off Jesus, started to sink, cried out, Lord, help me. Jesus helped him and then they went back to the boat. I, I want to teach using as a subject, do it again. Do it again. Do me a favor, won't you help me encourage your neighbor? Tell your neighbor, neighbor, you got to do it again. You got to do it again. Yeah. yeah. There's some things you started and it did not quite go well the first time. Some dreams, some visions that did not quite turn out right the first time. 
But help me preach to your neighbor. Tell your neighbor, do it again. Do it again. Do it. Do it. Do it again. Do it again. Winston Churchill was a British statesman who was prime minister of the United Kingdom. During a time of tremendous calamities, he rallied the British people. And it was recorded that he rallied them during a period of time that is known as the period that we experienced World War II. It was during that time that he led a people who were on the brink of defeat. And while they were literally looking defeat in the face, having exhausted so many attempts to usurp the, the demonic power that was trying to eliminate them, Churchill mounted the podium and in a moment decreed and declared with such power that the fear subsided and their anxiety immediately left. This is what Churchill said, ladies and gentlemen. He said to them, while on the brink of defeat, success, he said, is not final. Success is not final. Failure is not fatal. It is the courage to continue that counts. It is my contention that one of the greatest attribute that we must develop is a superpower that is called stick to -itiveness. This is the ability to experience difficulties, challenges, and setbacks. And in spite of the above mentioned obstacles, persevere anyway. Stick to -itiveness is a resilient mindset that is birthed out of a confidence that is baked in the love that God has for me. And this confidence that I have, not in my ability, but in his ability, when my back is against the wall, this confidence begins to whisper to me, you can do this anyway. It is out of this mindset that the colloquial expression is birthed, you have to learn how to take a licking and keep on ticking. It is, a, it is a determination that is analogous to that of the Energizer Bunny. That regardless of what life throws at me, I'm going to keep going and going and going and going. Now, please do not get it twisted by thinking our resiliency and tenacity originated with us. Our ability to push past the challenge, the obstacles and the barriers is not because of us but it is because of who is in us. For the Bible declares, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Do me a favor, I want you to get on the devil's nerve, touch yourself and say, there's greater in me, there's greater. I don't care what you're going through, it doesn't matter what the devil said, it doesn't matter what has not happened yet. Touch yourself, encourage yourself and tell yourself, there's greater in me, there's the reason why, ladies and gentlemen, I can come to this assertion, Tratitia, that greater is on the way is because the Bible lets us to know in Isaiah that when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of God will lift up a standard against him. Now, this is often quoted, Jeremiah, but I'm afraid, Tratitia, that most people don't even realize what God is implying within this text in Isaiah. He says, when the enemy comes in like a flood, then John of the Spirit of God will lift up, will raise up a standard against him. The Hebrew word for raising up a standard, tradition, the Hebrew word for lifting up a standard uh, is a word called noose. Yes, that's the Hebrew word for what is outlined in Isaiah. Uh, for lifting up a standard in the Hebrew, it is a word called noose. And noose suggests a making to praise and a chasing away. Th that's what it says. So consequently, hear me very carefully. God says, when the enemy comes in like a flood, hear me very carefully. If you open up your mouth and give God the glory, that which is trying to drown you will have to flee. Because God says, hear me very carefully, whenever you open up your mouth, there is no power that can come against a praiser. 
okay, let me see if I can help you. Let me see if I can help you. As a consequence, Tratisha, one scholar says that for the believer, praise is our escape strategy. Yes. That when my back is against the wall, when I am encased, when I am surrounded by problems and dilemma and challenges, all I've got to do is remember whose I am. And in the face of adversity, open up my mouth and tell the devil, I will bless the Lord at all times and his praise shall continuously be in my mouth. This is what, ladies and gentlemen, this is what we see in Acts, Jeremiah chapter 16, verse 25. In Acts chapter 16, verse 25, Paul and Silas realized that praise was their escape strategy. Yes, the Bible records in Acts chapter 16 and 25 uh, that they were doing nothing but good. They were doing nothing but good. They, that they were trying their best to be their best for God. And in trying their best to be their best, the Bible says that people got mad at them and sabotaged them. Let me park right here. That every now and then the evidence that you're on the right track is when people come against you. Because the enemy is not going to come against an individual who are not destined for greatness but because I'm doing the will and the work of God the devil will try to come and stop me but here's your good news no weapon that is for Ah, oh God, that is formed against me shall be able to prosper. Don't miss your praise. God never said that the weapon wouldn't be formed. He just said in this season, it's not going to work. You can talk about me, but it won't work. You can try to sabotage me, but it won't work. Do me a favor. Look at your name and say, it won't work. It won't. It, it will not work Tratisha they were doing the best they can they were doing good they were trying to live up to their divine calling and because they were doing good ladies and gentlemen they were thrown in jail yes they were doing nothing but the will of God they were doing nothing but the work of God and because they were doing good the enemy showed up yes this is what Paul meant when he said when I would do good evil is always present but thank be to God who has given me the power to overcome every demonic obstacle to overcome every demonic power what the enemy is trying to do weeping may endure for a night but joy oh. doing good and what they did they beat them doing good they publicly disgraced them doing good they publicly humiliated them. And when the public saw them being beaten down, Jeremiah, and humiliated, and when the public saw them being stripped, and when the public saw them being ostracized, people who were not spiritual thought they did something wrong. Uh, let me park here to suggest to somebody every now and then God will allow the enemy to put you in something and it's not because of what you're doing wrong it's because of what you're doing that's right I don't know who I'm talking to that's why the Bible says and we know you see the problem is you don't know because if you know that you know that you know that God is for me the Bible says they who are against me is nothing compare to the one who is for me thrown in jail and not only were they thrown in jail y'all because the enemy thinks that he can completely annihilate you when he have you because that's his job <laughs> he's not just trying to get you he's trying to destroy you you, you have to know that because in John 10 and 10 clause A, the Bible says the, gen the enemy's motive is to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But Jesus says, don't worry, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. So when your back is against the wall, all you have to do is stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. I must be in the wrong church. The Bible says, having done all you can, Damn. thrown in jail and Silas looked at Paul and said are we going to do it now he said no nah, not yet they took them out of population out of, and placed Jeremiah in solitary confinement 
And Paul and Silas said, Paul looked at Silas and said, now, Silas said, no, not now. They, they shackled their hands and shackled their feet. And, and Paul looked at Silas and said, no, not yet. The devil made a mistake. And you got to know that the enemy, he is such an idiot. He placed them in solitary confinement. He bound their hands and he tied up their feet, but he left their mouth open. And as long as I've got my mouth, God help me, I can get God. Or is there anybody? in here that's got to praise at the point that I dare to give God the glory ah, he messed with your money but he did not mess with your praise he messed with your marriage but he did not mess with your praise and when and when they praise God the Bible said that God sent Jen an earthquake when they praised God. Scholars deduce, mom, when they praised God and God sent the earthquake and the jail doors were bur burst open, it wasn't God trying to break them out. It was God trying to get in. Because the Bible says he inhabits the praises of his people the mature believers hear me the mature believers are those who can praise God not for what he got me out of but for what God got into with me that when I was at my lowest he said I'll be a friend that stick it closer I thank God not for what he brings me out of but for what God gets into with me he said if you make your bed in hell I don't know who I'm talking to. There is absolutely nothing that you can go through where God won't show up. God help me. There's absolutely nothing that you can experience. That God, that God will not show up. Church Hill says that our success is not final and failure is not fatal. It is believed that, uh, that failure every now and then, Jocelyn becomes God's classroom. that he uses to teach you lessons that you can't learn in success. Because success creates the tendency to become comfortable. I will argue theologically, and I wish if I had time, I would back it up with so many scriptures, it would overwhelm you, that, that, that you don't grow most often than not, most often than not, you do not grow in success. You grow in failure. That failure is an opportunity for God to take you to the next level. But here is the caveat. Whenever you fail, you've got to say to yourself, it failed, not me. God. It failed. I'm not the failure. The problem is, is when you personalize your failure. Thinking that I failed. No, it failed. I ain't failed. The marriage failed. I ain't failed, the business failed. I ain't failed, that opportunity failed. But God, if you give me another shot, I'll do it again. In scripture, Spicer, there is no greater example of a failure who understand the power of failing than Peter. Now I must warn you, Peter, is not the quintessential Christian. As a matter of fact, Peter was a type of brother that we, perhaps some of y'all wouldn't even want him to join the point. Because Peter wasn't fully de delivered, he was getting delivered. There were some tendencies and some proclivities that Peter had not yet shaken. As a matter of fact, Peter was a type that Peter would walk with Jesus, 
How he, he would he would worship Jesus, he would praise Jesus, but but if you push Peter the wrong way, Peter would have a relapse and go in his pocket, pull out a switchblade and go to work on you. Peter was the kind of person that if you violate him, he'll put fingers on, he'll put hands on you and then talk later. That's who Peter was. P Peter was save-ish. Holy-ish. Yeah, uh, that's Peter. Peter. Peter will praise and cuss. And, 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 and this Peter, this Peter, this Peter was the oddball in the group. Because Peter has, Pastor Charles, he, 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 is, he was diagnosed with a problem that most of us have. We just can't shut up. I mean, I mean, Peter will address the elephant in the room. Peter was a kind of brother that if you push him the wrong way, he's not going to bite his lip. He's not going to go along to get along. He's going to now you know that wasn't right. Do that one more time and there's going to be a misunderstanding. Peter. Peter loved God. But Vincent, Peter was from the hood. And even though he got saved, Joe, he did not divorce himself from his hood tendencies. And so they're on the boat. Now, Rianda, I'm almost done. And Jesus says to them, go to the other side. That blessed me, Chaplain Tracy. Jesus, Dr. Myra said to them, go to the other side. He never makes mistakes when he speaks. He's always attentional and he always means what he says. Jesus said to them, go to the other side, which means whatever happens in the process, your destination is the other side, which means don't trip when the storm comes because I've given you a word and your word is the other side which means don't lose your mind in the storm because you're going to need your mind for the other side which means trouble don't last always but there is an other side it is another side every every coin has two sides and so it may be tail today but just flip that bad boy one more time because there's always another side. Says to them, go to the other side and uh, a storm comes and, and uh, when the storm comes, Xavier, they're on the boat and they're in a storm and they forget about his word, go to the other side. They're in the storm and they begin to panic. Lord, we're going to die. No, you're not going to die. I told you, you're going to the other side. They're in the storm. Everything that, that could go wrong is going wrong. And the Bible said that while they were in the storm, Jesus shows up. But he does not show up to Tisha in a conventional way. He doesn't pull up on another boat. Jesus is walking on water in the storm. They're on the boat, and whenever you're on the boat, you gotta be careful who's on the boat with you. Because those who you're connected to on the boat have the power to change your perspectives and how you see things. Because one of my mentors, he told me this way, he said, Andre, your association determines your destination. Sometimes, watch this, what they see will dictate what you see. He's on the boat with both people. People who think boat. Talk boat. All they know Jeremiah is boat. You've got to be careful when you're on the boat. He's on the boat. Jesus is walking on water. 
the Bible says that the both people say it's a ghost. Theologically, this troubled me, Patricia, because uh, if anybody should recognize Jesus, it's his disciples. And the lesson that the text is telling to teach us is that sometimes storms can obscure your vision. It can obstruct your vision. It can, it can cause you to see the right thing the wrong way. Yes. They're looking at Jesus. And they don't see Jesus, they see a ghost. And people who don't know Bible criticize them. <laughs> and in the midst of them seeing the wrong thing, the Bible says, Pastor Charles, that Jesus spoke up and said, don't be afraid, it is I. Yes. Now, Dr. Mara, I found solace in that. When Jesus spoke up and said, do not be afraid, it is I. Even though you can see me, even though I'm not visible, even though I'm not clear, if you can hear me. My theology is a little bit different. My, my theology, Jeremiah, may not be like everybody's theology because I prescribe to a notion that when my back is against the wall, I don't need to see Jesus. I just need to hear him. Uh, uh, because whenever you're in a storm, the prerequisite to come out of the storm is not intellect but faith. Yes, when you're in a storm, you cannot every now and then you'll be in something where you cannot think your way out of. You got to believe your way out of. The problem, ladies and gentlemen, is if, if I cannot see him, but I can hear him, that will empower my faith because faith comes by. Yeah, as long as I can hear God, the Bible says his word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So even when I can't see him, if I can hear him. Which now brings into question or, or presents this idea that when I'm in a storm, I can't talk to everybody. Because everything that comes to you in a storm is predicated on what you hear. Some people, watch this, you go to the doctor, you feel good. Routine checkup, you skip in there. Because you know it's going to be a good visit. You see the doctor, you're, you have excitement and energy. Hey doc, you're very loquacious, you're talkative, you're chatty. What's going on, Doc? How's the kids? Wife doing good? You gonna go to the golf course with me, Doc? The doctor runs his exam or her examination and, and you're chipper, you're excited, you're, you're full of joy. He submits the test and gets the result. You're excited, you are all happy as happy can be. And then he says you got cancer. And all of a sudden, everything that resembles joy is replaced with fear. What happened? You heard something that compelled you to operate in a way that is foreign from how you went in there. Most of you have abandoned your vision, not because God wasn't going to do it, but because you heard something. Most of you have walked away from your dream, not because of the devil, but because you heard something. I had time I would walk you all through our Bible where the wrong conversation led to the abortion of vision and destiny. Eve did nothing wrong but had the wrong conversation. And when Eve heard something that wasn't in line with God, uh, are y'all hearing me? She lost everything. Peter says, oh God, if that's you, oh, tell me to come. To which Jesus says, oh, come. And this is where I'm going to quit for until next weekend. Shay, he's, he's walking on water. He steps off the boat, Lady Charles, and he's walking on what he should sink in. He is walking, he is walking on what should swallow him up. He's defying the very 
notion of science. He is, he is, he is doing something that people say shouldn't be done. And the question now becomes, how is he doing it? Because his eyes is on Jesus. And as long as he's focused on Jesus, he can walk in what he should be sinking in. But the Bible lets us to know, watch this, that he shifts his focus. And when he shifts his focus, when he was no longer Angela looking at Jesus, scripture said he began to sink. <sighs> Spice, I've got to park here parenthetically to ask somebody, could it be that you're sinking not because of the devil? but because of what you're looking at. That you've changed your focus. You were focused, you were disciplined, you were dedicated, you were committed, but you've shifted your focus. And now you're looking at mom, what, 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 is, what you're going through instead of who you're going towards. I'm looking at the dilemma. I'm looking at the storm. I'm looking at my circumstances. When the Bible says, I will lift my eyes to the hills. From whence cometh my help. And he's sinking. And the scripture says, as he was sinking, he prayed. Dr. Mara, he prayed a three-word prayer. Lord, help me. He's sinking. And Patrice, he did not say, Father, in the name of Jesus, no other help I know. If thou should draw thyself from me. Y'all know how we get. Just deep. He, he didn't have time for the eloquence of speech. Because real prayer, hear me, real prayer don't come from the head, it flows from the heart. Prayer is about a heart posture. A lot of people, they're giving God head knowledge. And he told us, man, look at the outer appearance, but God looks at the it's a heart posture. You can say Jesus from your heart and he'll show up. And he prayed a three word prayer. Lord, help me. And Jesus reached down and grabbed him. And I'm done. And for years, Lester, I've heard preachers talk about the miracle being Jesus reaching down grabbing Peter. I've heard national evangelists and scholars who, who, who can preach you under the rug and they, they, they have exegete the text and they conclude that the miracle is when Jesus reached down and pulled him up. I mean, we've had church around this idea of Jesus reaching down and pulling up. We, we, we have cliche phrases uh, around this idea of Jesus reaching down and pulling him up. And we've deduced that's the miracle. I, I want to present a different perspective. And I'm done. That the miracle was not Jesus reaching down and pulling him up. The miracle is in Peter doing it again. Because after Jesus reached down and pulled them up, Tratisha, hear me very carefully. The Bible says that he walked back on the thing that he sunk in. That, that the very thing that I failed in in previous seasons. God, if you pull me up one more time, I'll do it again. That the miracle is the very thing that I was just sinking in. God, if you can get me out of this. And when God pulled them up, can you imagine what Peter must have felt? Turning around with spectators looking at him. He had an audience to his failure. And he's walking back. And don't, mix, don't miss the revelation in the text. 
in the storm. The storm isn't over. I failed before, but I'm going to do it anyway. And it was when he did it again, read the text, that chapter 32 said, when he got to the boat, the storm subsided. That your power is in your ability to do it again. Media, help me play something softly and I'm done. That your power is in the perseverance, the resiliency to do it again. And, and I'm done. Dr. Myra, about 10 years ago, Empowerment Center Jeremiah was four years in its ministry. And we were having unprecedented success. I mean, things that were happening. I couldn't I could not have planned it how God was just turning things around the who's who of Albany wanted to partner with our ministry and 99% of my congregation at that time was under 30 and every parent wanted their child to come because we had proven results I mean we we had teenagers and folks in their 20s who were meeting with editors of newspaper and, and common council rep and we would take ministry to unconventional places and spaces and, 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 and share with them the vision and place demands on them. And the city was percolating and things were happening. And, uh, and, uh, and then I got creative. Man, I got innovative. God was so much on our ministry that, that we had a, a revival and, 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 the, and I preached a revival and, and uh, uh, we had uh, 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 props and we built jail cells and, 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 and behind the jail cells we put depression and we put anxiety and we put STDs and, and, and we were preaching deliverance and healing and, and a lady who was, was raped, Jeremiah, if you remember, she was raped, watch this, hours prior to the revival came to the revival with the residue of what just happened and gave her life to Jesus. We were doing ministry in unconventional ways. A gentleman who was, who was manning the drug spot heard the word and left the weed spot, came and sat in service and gave his life to Jesus Christ. Ministry in unconventional ways. And then your boy got creative, got innovative. I thought I could help God. God, I got it from here. You helped to get us to this point. The rest, you chill, I got it. And, and, and I began to innovate and we succeeded. And one day in prayer, I heard the Lord say, he said, do you want the success without me? blow you up Andre but I won't be with you and y'all I felt the withdrawing of God's presence he said shut it down and they'll tell you he said close it down because you lost yourself thinking this is your church this ain't your show you are just a prop that I'm using it ain't about you shut it down then uh, with tears in their eyes they they pastor don't do it and I shut it down three months later the Lord says start it back up but this time I want you to preach to chairs and for almost four months I preached to nothing but chairs so God what in the world I'm called to people and here's what he said to me no you're not called to people you're called to me whatever I tell you to do because if you can preach to cheers, whether the church is packed or not, if you can preach to cheers and give it your all, you will always see the value, hear this, in one. If you can see the value in none, you'll see the value. And we start back up. And I'm done. And I'm done. And 
and, and pastor, we start back up weeks before Easter. And uh, I'm a slow learner sometimes. So, so I said, God, we start back up. We gotta, it's, it's, it's the Super Bowl. It's Easter. We gotta get them here. Send out 5,000 letters door to door. Got a lot of promises. Are we coming? We know the word is good. We come in. It's Easter Sunday. We come in. I said, I said, Jen, we're going to have service outside on Easter Sunday for the multitudes because they're coming. Got my best suit. Sylvia was there. Jeremiah was there. Got my praise and worship team together. We only had one song for an entire year. Welcome into this place. I mean, we sang that song every which way possible. Square, slow, remix. Welcome to this place. And Pastor, we put our chairs in. Three people there. And I felt such defeat. I felt so discouraged. Three people showed up. I remember pastors heard about it and started laughing at us saying he's hit his peak there'll never be anything better than this one pastor called me and he said it's over don't you know that that upstate is the graveyard for pastors it's over he said, son, go to a metropolitan city. Go and, and, and because it's over here. And I remember sitting down in the dark, feeling the weight, Vincent, of failure, crying profusely. Saying, God, why did you call me to embarrass myself? Why did you chose me to do this if you know it wasn't going to work? that's when he told me, he said, do it again. Do it again. At that time, I did not know that there was a point of praise in my future. But God told me, do it again. Had I quit that day, Jeremiah, we wouldn't be here. God said, do it again. And with tears in my eyes, the feeling of embarrassment, it so much over and over we did it and we did it and we did it until God led me to a man who said son I can see something in you because if you have the tenacity to fail and do it again I don't know who I'm talking to but I'm not the only one you're sitting in this place and you feel the weight of failure. People wrote you off. So you ain't never going to be nothing. Your best days are, beh are, are behind you. You're just like your mama. You're just like your daddy. You're a mess up. But God sent me here to tell you, do it again do it again. Have the courage to do what God has placed in your heart. Feel the pressure. Feel the fear and do it anyway. If you're going to fail, fail forward. But do it again. For better is the end of a thing than the beginning. And Tratitia, it is only God who can give you something that you've never had before and say to you, this is not your end. This is only the beginning. God, how can bigger be the beginning? How can better be the beginning? Because he said, I'll take you from glory to glory to glory. What qualifies me to be the pastor, Jeremiah? It's because I'm a failure, but I'll do it again.
you can't get me to quit. You cannot make me give up. Oh God, I, I'm too stubborn to walk away from what God says. Everybody can leave today. I tell Pastor Charles, we're going to do it anyway. And that is the mindset that you've got to have. Let them walk away from you. Do it again. Let them walk, talk about you. Do it again. For he who is for you is more than they who are against you. Everyone close your eyes, bow your heads, all eyes closed. All eyes closed. I want to open the doors for all of, for everyone who is like your pastor. You're a failure who connected with a God who looked beyond your faults and has identified that there's something in you that he can use. I want to open the church today for those who want to give your lives to God. Every eye is closed. Listen, you failed doing it your way. Now it's time to do it his way. We serve a God that, he's the God that can recycle. He never just throw you away. He said, I'll use you, I'll pick you up, I'll clean you up, and I'll use you again. If you're in this place and you're saying, Pastor, I want to give my life to Jesus, won't you raise your hand? Won't you raise your hand? I see that hand. Is there another that says, Pastor, I want to see those hands. I see, is there another that says, Pastor, I want to. I want to give my life to Jesus Christ. I want to give my life to Jesus Christ. Yes. I see those hands. Wow. Wow. With your hands raised. With your hands raised. Every eye closed. I'm going to ask, with your hands raised and your eyes closed, I'm going to ask, our altar workers, please go and stand by someone that you're closest to with your hands raised. I'm going to pray corporately, but I want you to stand with them. Yes, I want you to stand with them. We do not want them to stand by themselves. Yes. our attempt to embarrass you, it is our attempt to empower you. Father, I pray over those whose hands is lifted right now in the name of Jesus, that you have pressed the restart button on their lives, and that you've given them another opportunity to do life again. And this time, God, they're doing it with you. I pray that everything that failed before that was in your will, God, I pray now in the name of Jesus that you will give them supernatural success. Completely, God, renew their minds and completely transform their lives. God, tell everybody that you did it and there's nothing like living for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Everyone keep your eyes closed except for those who are standing with those individuals if you raise your hand I want you to take your stuff you're going to go into the back area with the individuals that you're standing next to and what's going to happen they're going to take you back and they're going to pray a prayer with you they're going to have you repeated I don't want you to say from your head I want it to flow from your heart and then they're going to give you something that's called now what now that you're giving your life to God this, these are the steps that you must take and we're going to take it with you the person who's standing next to you, they're going to be your salvation coach. For the next few weeks, they're going to do life with you. They're going to give you their numbers and they're going to take yours. And whenever you need someone to pray with, you can call them. They're going to check in with you, ask you, how is it going? And I want you to be completely honest with them. 
whatever you don't understand you're going to share with them whatever you're getting the hang of you're going to share with them we're going to celebrate the victories and we're going to help you through the challenges because we're better together the person that's standing next to you those of you who raise your hand to be saved the person that's standing next to you they're not going to leave you until you're strong enough to take steps without their assistance and even then what's going to happen even when you take those steps without their assistance they're going to be linked with you because we believe firmly that we're better at this thing together point of praise for those three who raised their hand I need you to give God the biggest baddest praise that you can come on let's bless you. Come on, y'all could do better than that. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on, point. Y'all could do better than that. Come on, souls just got saved. Come on, souls just got saved. Come on, point. Y'all could do better than that. This is what it's all about. This is what it's all about. Vincent, I was talking to Vincent, he texted me, Anquinette, and what Vincent said, he said to me, he said, Pastor, he said, no one could have told me a year ago that I'd be on fire for Jesus like I am now. He said, but I've discovered that in a world of negativity and challenges, people are looking for Jesus. We just have to be visible enough so that they can see his light in us. Y'all, we're getting ready to leave, but I, I've got to tell y'all this. Y'all, Spicer, you won't even believe what happened. I'm trying to go to bed last night, and my Facebook just keep going off. Bing, bing, bing. I'm trying to go to sleep. It's about 10.30. I forgot to turn my ringer off. I only cut it on because Pastor Charles was getting on me that day and saying, what if I was in the hospital and trying to call you? I said, oh, okay, let me keep my ringer on. It was bing, bing, bing. I checked Messenger. Folks said, Pastor Lewis, we want to join the church. We want to be partners of the point. We recognize and realize what's happening. And we don't want to be left behind. This is the church where everybody is somebody. This is the church where your gifts and purpose, if you don't know what you'll discover it. If you have it already, we'll help you develop it. And if it's developed, then we're going to help you deploy it. We only have one rule at the point. You cannot just come here and be the same. But we believe that you have to go to a whole different level and a whole different stratosphere. Hear me very carefully, and I'm unapologetic about this. If you want to go to a church where they're just content with having church, this is not the church for you. If you want to go to a church where they could just have, where you're going to have holy huddles and it's me, my four, and no more, this is not the church for you. But if you want to be a part of a church where the kingdom is the priority, souls are the mission, and moving to our next place in God is our focus, then there's no other place like the point of praise. I want to open the doors of the church, and I promise you we'll leave, and I want to open the doors of the church for everyone who says, Pastor Lewis, I want to make the point my church home. Won't you come now? Give me your hand, but most importantly, give Jesus your heart. Is there anyone who said, Pastor, I want to make this church the church that I connect with? I know you guys are on the lobby now. You're heading to the penthouse. And once you're at the penthouse, it's key access only. If you're here, you want to join the portal phrase, won't you raise your hand? I'll come get you right where you are. Spicy, you're a member already. He's we got a hell spot. Is there one in here that want to join the point of praise? You feel compelled to make this church your church home? Amen. I, I led three people last night via uh, Facebook, but I feel like I, I just need to lead at least one today in, in person to be a part of our church. Are you here? You want to be a member of the most dynamic church on the planet? Amen. So point members, we have partners. We have work to do. Amen. We have work to do. We have work to do, amen? Amen, stand to your feet, stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. Y'all can't be having the pastor 
bring people into our church at 1045 at night. Amen. And we're not doing it, amen, consistently. So everywhere you go becomes an opportunity for somebody to join the church. Amen. Amen. And I'm telling y'all by the end of this year, by December 31st, 2023, here's my prayer. Here's my focus. And here's my objective. That my mother, Dr. Elizabeth Campbell, will be a point partner. Pastor said, get her now, go get her now. I'm telling you, by the end of this year, if she's not a partner and she show, ends up missing. <laughs> Amen. Raise your right hand. Repeat after me. By this shall all men know that we're his disciples. If we have love, one for another. You came to worship, now leave to serve. Hug somebody and tell them I love you and that's the bottom line.